Well, thanks a lot for the nice introduction and thanks also Elio and Thomas for giving me the opportunity to present uh, my talk here at this very nice conference. And uh, as Thomas already anticipated, I really hope to, to shine a light on this vertex divergence uh, issue and, and answer the remaining questions um, of the previous sessions. So my talk will be about say sticky electrons, but really it's about how we can actually flip the sign of the effective interaction from a strong repulsion, we get an attraction in specific scattering channels. And as we will see, this is intimately uh, connected to vertex divergences. Let me just state that this is work done in collaboration with many people, among them also Matthias Reitner, my former master student who did a lot of important work in this project. So vertex divergences. So far, we heard a lot of their origin in the very nice talk by Alessandro Toski. We saw how the formation of a local moment is reflected in the charge channel, in the suppressed susceptibilities, and in the appearance of vertex divergences. On the other hand, we saw in the very nice talk by Georg how we can really have a profound analytic understanding of the vertex divergences, their relation with the Latinger board functional multivaluedness, and uh, how, they, uh, how they behave in the atomic limit and binary mixture case. The missing piece of the puzzle, if you so want, is what are their implications? How, how do we see them arise and how, where do we see their effects? And for this, uh, I'm going to take a quick step back. So in the talk by Alessandro, we saw how the local moment formation on the one hand led to the vertex divergences and suppressed the local susceptibility. Diagrammatically speaking, we so far were on the local level. So we used the uh, local irreducible vertex, uh, we calculated the local generalized susceptibility, and we saw how sine flips created the vertex divergences and negative eigenvalues suppressed the susceptibility. To see now an effect of these vertex divergences, we need to, let's say, leave the local basis and look somewhere else, namely, at the lattice beta cell beta equation. So what we will be doing now is using the irreducible vertex, uh, putting it into a lattice beta cell beta equation um, in a DMFT calculation, which I will show you in a moment. Why would we do that and what do we expect? Well, if you think of an RPA expression for a charge susceptibility as a function of Q, you will note that if your interaction that you put into this would change sign, would be negative, you would see an enhancement in your susceptibility in a very basic RPA formulation here. Um, of course, we know, and this is an idea pushed by, by the very nice paper by the Tremblay group, um, that the vertex has many sign changes. That was the, the, the talk by Alessandro and Georg. And interpreting this irreducible vertex which turns negative after the vertex divergences as an effective interaction, we may relate their uh, design structure to an enhancement in the susceptibility. And this will be the topic of my talk. So where are we gonna look for such an enhancement and, and, and maybe a connection to the vertex divergences? It's gonna be the isothermal compressibility of the Hubbard model. Now, Kappa, so the isothermal compressibility, can be calculated in two different ways. On the one hand, from a one particle perspective, where we use the derivative of the occupation with respect to the chemical potential, or as uh, the uniform charge susceptibility, the uniform static charge susceptibility. In DMFD, this is given by the irreducible vertex, which I showed you before. But let me state here very clearly, that this is a well understood uh, phenomena. Uh, so the, the, the compressibility, how this behaves close to the mod transition was studied almost uh, 20 years ago in this nice paper here. And we know that this shows even a divergence close to the mod transition. Um, so our objective here is, is really to show how this is connected to the vertex divergences, that the compressibility diverges is well understood. But for pedagogical purposes, let me quickly flash you some results to get a feeling 
of where we will do our calculations and what we will be looking at. So this is now a calculation uh, in the project we, we performed. So this is not taken from these publications, but uh, given this publication here. What you see here is a schematic representation of the mod metal insulator transition. In the very back, you have the half filling plane metal insulator, the mod transition with the coexistence region and the critical end point. And out of plane comes the chemical potential axis. We will be actually considering hole doping. And as you can see, you still find coexistence regions. You find critical endpoints now of so-called phase separations. And what we'll be interested in is this dotted line that is somehow coming out of the plane, which is basically a line of critical endpoints. Our computations will follow this green arrow. So we will change the chemical potential and we will always come from above. So we'll never enter the, let's say, details of which solutions we have. We always have one solution. We're always above the critical endpoint, decreasing the temperature. And uh, as a result for kappa, let me show you now the one particle calculation. So what we have here, kappa is a function of mu. 1.2 is half filling for uh, the model we are looking at. This is now a Hubbard model, square lattice calculation without T prime. And as you see, starting out from uh, 1 over 30 temperature, we decrease the temperature and we get this, oopsie, this strongly peaked behavior here. You see the increase of kappa close to mu 1.1. Now, um, if we now go to the two particle perspective, we can perform basically, uh, we expect the same result. We perform a different calculation. And as you can see, I only did the calculation for, uh, for this, uh, let's say, close to the critical endpoint temperature. Uh, and the red squares are our two particle calculation, which are very nicely following this behavior of kappa. So, so far, so good. This was just to give you a feeling for the compressibility uh, in the system, how this is now connected to vertex divergences. Where should we see their effect showing up in this compressibility? Well, for that, let's take a quick peek at the lattice beta's data equation. Um, I will keep it as simple and as quick as possible. So what we put in there in the uniform susceptibility is the locally reducible vertex and uh, this Q equals zero bubble. We will look at this problem now for the beta lattice case. This is, of course, a very simple case, but it has the advantage that these like, uh, two terms, these two bubble terms, are really simple in the beta lattice case and basically give a constant. So we do not have any dependence on filling. We do not have any dependence on Matsubara frequencies or whatsoever. It's just a constant depending on temperature and hopping. What we will also be doing is uh, diagonalizing our generalized susceptibility, our generalized local susceptibility, like Alessandro has shown you. Um, and we will be looking at eigenvalues and eigenweights of this local susceptibility. These eigenweights are basically some eigenvectors. Um, later in my talk, I will give you some details on, on their calculation. Now, putting this all together, we find this equation for the compressibility. Uh, and let's take, let's take a quick look at this equation. So we have the sum over all eigenvalues, uh, one over the local generalized stability eigenvalue, the constant term and an inversion and the weight. And this tells us because of the plus sign that we actually need negative eigenvalues to create an enhancement of kappa. More specifically, if this condition is close to being fulfilled, so if one over lambda is negative enough to reach this condition, we would trigger a divergence here, a divergence in the compressibility. And this of course only holds if the weight is equal to zero. Now, at this point, it's, it's uh, instructive to take a quick step back and uh, I showed you the results for kappa where we see this one enhancement and Alessandro showed you these nice plots of the phase diagrams for these vertex divergences, where we have seen infinitely many divergence lines. There seems to be a mismatch. I'm telling you that these eigenvalues are, of course, are responsible for a possible enhancement of kappa, but there are infinitely many. However, we do not see an oscillatory behavior of the compressibility. So what's going on? At this point, 
we need to actually perform a calculation. And uh, we will be looking at the beta lattice case um, coming again from above, decreasing the temperature. So what we see here, this is now eigenvalue as a function of u. Uh, we see how this eigenvalue approaches this condition. Uh, here again is the condition for triggering an enhancement of kappa. And you see it's only fulfilled for the first one. And indeed, that's the lowest eigenvalue we have. And that's also the solution to this conundrum. So all the other eigenvalues that create vertex divergences are negative, but they are not negative enough to reach this condition. And indeed, for the beta lattice case at half filling, we trigger this condition right at the critical endpoint. However, at half filling, there is no effect. We do not have uh, an enhancement of kappa or a, even a divergence due to symmetry reasons. Let me point out that this was very nicely pointed out in this uh, independent publication by Eric van Loon, Friedrich Green, and Angelika Tarnin from a totally different perspective. It's a really nice paper. And they also show that at half filling, you will not see an enhancement of the compressibility due to symmetry reasons. And with that, I want to quickly discuss now this symmetry reason. So what's going on? At half filling, or more generally, at particle hole symmetry, we have a real bisymmetric general susceptibility in the charge channel. This, uh, what's important now for this talk is that this ensures that we have real eigenvalues, they are strictly, strictly real, and the eigenweights are always positive, real, can be zero or larger than zero. And due to the question by Jörg Schmalian in the, in the last, in the talk by Alessandro, I also put here uh, a result for the eigenvectors. As I said, the weights are calculated by uh, uh, summing over the eigenvectors. They can be proven to be either antisymmetric or symmetric. And of course, with an antisymmetric eigenvector, you would get a zero weight. This is all nicely uh, pointed out in this publication I cited here on the bottom. But how can we now see an effect of this connection between the enhancement of kappa and the vertex divergences? In the end, we need to break, break particle hole symmetry. Uh, and we will do so by going out of half filling. Uh, in te technically speaking, we will then have a symmetric central hermitian matrix, a symmetric central hermitian generalized suscitability. This will ensure that we have either real eigenvalues or complex conjugate pairs. And the weights, however, will be strictly real. They can be negative, but they will be strictly real. Um, and with that, I want to now show you a calculation where we see this connection. So we come back now to the Hubbard model calculation, square lattice. Uh, again, we follow this green arrow. I also sketched here for you the first two divergence lines in the half filling plane. Um, and let me just quickly remind you of the results we get for kappa. Again, we have this increase at 1.1. Uh, and the two particle calculations nicely reproduce the result. But now we have the machinery to really understand where this is coming from, how the mechanism works. And for that, let's go back to the beta psi beta equation. Here we have it again. Uh, and what I will do now is basically I will split up the parts uh, corresponding to the different eigenvalues. On the one hand, the red term from it coming from the first eigenvalue, uh, the second term coming from the second, and then basically all the rest. What I didn't show you is that the local susceptibility, that is not a local charge fluctuations, can be calculated by only using lambda times weight. Um, and now let's take a look at the results. So what we have here now is the eigenvalues of the local generalized susceptibility as a function of chemical potential. And here at minus one, uh, 0 0.1, we are at the maximum of kappa. And by this blue shaded region and this dashed line, uh, we show you here this, this criterion of triggering this divergence, which is really closely to the minimum of lambda. We can really see how this lowest eigenvalue will blow up this uh, enhancement criterion or this divergence criterion. 
at half filling, uh, we, we rise again with the eigenvalue. And what's important here is that all the other eigenvalues are higher. They are negative, but they are higher, not triggering this condition. Now, the eigenweights, as I told you, at half filling, this red one, so corresponding to this first eigenvalue, is strictly zero due to symmetry reasons. However, as we dope the system and go out of half filling, we find that the eigenweight is actually lower than zero. And now let's go back to our little uh, beta tau beta equation analysis. What we will have now is that this first term will be close to triggering a divergence. And if you think a second about the sign, you will see that this is actually going to minus infinity first. However, as I showed you, the weight is lower than zero. This will be now important because you see how the minuses cancel and we will actually get a positive dominant contribution to our uniform susceptibility. This is the sign flip I was talking about. The sign flip of this uh, lambda is crucial to get the effective attraction of the uniform susceptibility. On the other hand, we see how the second term is also lower than zero, but has a positive weight. This will be a suppression of the kappa, of the uh, compressibility. Now let's take a look at the results again. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm calling this term one and two, just to uh, let you know. Uh, what we see here again is kappa as a function of mu. And for these four squares, I'm showing you now this detailed analysis we made. In the first row, we have the uniform. In the second row, the local susceptibility. And these bars represent now basically these contributions that these individual terms have. Now, what we can see here on the first, uh, the first thing we can notice is that the maximum of kappa is basically controlled by this dominant red bar here. This is the first, re uh, first real negative eigenvalue that is negative enough to trigger this condition and give us an enhancement of kappa because of the negative weight. On the other hand, we see that at half filling, there is no enhancement of kappa due to symmetry reasons. These first terms are gone because of particle hole symmetry. Let me also point out that if you follow this first contribution here, you also see how it mimics nicely the overall behavior of kappa. You see it rises here up to 1.1 and then decreases steeply. What we also can understand is that comparing the uniform and the local susceptibility, this first term basically explains this dichotomy. So we see an enhanced uniform susceptibility from a suppressed, hardly changing local susceptibility. Um, but we see tiny, tiny attractive contributions, which of course are not divergence because we do not have these bubble terms giving us this constant contribution. So far so good, this was for the uniform susceptibility. What else can we learn? Well, we can, take, we can make a full Q analysis. So what we will be doing is basically looking at You hear me? Now we can hear you again. Yeah, yeah. I think ah. you, were, you were briefly frozen, and we were wondering whether it was on our side. Uh, ah. Maybe it was on our side. I'm yeah. really sorry. Uh, yeah, where did you, where did I stop? It was on the MPI side. Sorry. Uh, you you started from the Q analysis. Okay. So um, we will perform now a full Q analysis, and here um, you see how we're at the maximum of kappa. You see this strongly peaked chi of q uh, at q0,0. Zero, zero. And at half filling, we only find the shallow maximum. As I pointed out, due to symmetry reasons, this first term is gone. And what we will be doing now is basically taking this maximum kappa contribution and splitting up again all these terms for each q point individually. What are we finding here? You see how we have a strongly peaked term uh, coming from this first term, so coming from the lowest real negative eigenvalue, this first term I showed you in the beginning, uh, and the rest, so summing up all the rest, basically looks like the half-filling result. 
And this explains us a lot why we see this maximum of kappa half filling it's gone because this term is missing due to symmetry reasons. And with that, I want to do a brief recap. So what, what have we seen so far? We saw how the, uh, how the strong repulsion can create local moment formation. And this local moment formation, as Alessandro nicely pointed out in his talk, will lead to singularities. We will find these vertex divergences. In my talk, I showed you how this is related to the increase of kappa and can even trigger a phase separation. Five more, five more minutes. Five more minutes. That's how the stickiness, if you so want, comes in. We really flip the sign of the effective interaction due to the sign flips of these eigenvalues you see here. Sorry. Um, this reminds us a bit, maybe, of the of the liquid vapor transition, this phase separation, like in the van der Waals gas. But let me point out clearly that we did not put an attraction in that came out due to the sign flip. And this already poses an important question on, on how to like reflect on these results I showed you. We saw that we got an effective attraction in the uniform charge response. What about other channels? What can we learn about maybe non-perturbative instabilities, phase transitions? Well, let's look, let's go back uh, to the beta lattice case now. This is why we have the simple uh, expressions here. We, uh, I put you here the particle hole susceptibility for Q equals zero. We can have this plus sign. And uh, this um, expression would, uh, if, if you see an enhancement here, this would correspond to phase separation instabilities in the charge channel or ferromagnetic instability. On the other hand, we can look at this expression at Q equals pi or the pairing uh, susceptibility at Q equals zero. This, of course, would signal charge density wave uh, uh, instabilities, superconductivity S wave, or antiferromagnetism. And here you notice the important difference. It is in the left expression that we need a minimal negative eigenvalue to trigger an instability. On the right side, it's a maximal positive eigenvalue. And to sum this up now in a schematic way, I'm showing you here a generic susceptibility, a local susceptibility. To trigger uh, instabilities on the right, you will need a maximal positive eigenvalue. However, to trigger the instability on the left, you would need a minimal negative one. What's important now about this? Well, if you think about it, you need the sign changes. You need to be able to describe vertex divergences. And this puts already an important constraint. Uh, so you really, to see this lower part of the spectrum, you need to flip your signs of the eigenvalues. This puts an important constraint. It was also discussed a bit in this uh, other publication I'm showing you here at the bottom. Let's take, for example, a, a FRG, a functional randomization group, which would be happily possible, uh, capable of describing a maximal positive eigenvalue, describing uh, this. However, FRG lacks the possibility to describe sign flips of eigenvalues of the local susceptibility. There are no vertex divergences in FRG methods. So basically, this wall puts a strong constraint on the FRG method. Um, on the other hand, let me point out that, for example, the MF square RG, so starting from a correlated start point, would overcome this, uh, this I don't know, wall, if you so want. Um, and with that, I want to, uh, let me just point out, I, I used FRG just for a, one example. You could also think of the Paquet approximation uh, and other theories, of course. And with that, I want to uh, come to my summary. So I talked to you about the implications of, of this appearance of vertex divergences, how we can understand the mechanism, really, the microscopical mechanism behind the enhancement of kappa due to the sign flip and the getting enough negative of this first eigenvalue. On the other hand, I described to you how we can then think of if you want non-perturbative instabilities to really rise up from negative eigenvalues of our local susceptibility. And with that, let me also give a quick summary and outlook of this whole vertex divergence topic. If you want, let me collect my, my puzzle stones here. So we learned a lot of, of the origin, we learned a lot of the analysis and the implications of this vertex divergence. 
putting this together, you can think that we now understood how this local moment formation on the local impurity side really uh, reflects itself on the chart, onto the charge channel by the strong suppression, by the appearance of vertex divergences. And these negative eigenvalues can trigger, in some cases, some interesting instabilities. Oh, sorry, this uh, right plot uh, got, got stuck here. So um, what's going on? How can we, can we now extend or give an outlook of this topic where we can use this piece of information, this, this non-perturbative physics, for example, think of multi-orbital systems. Here, we of course know that the Huns, the, the Huns exchange can trigger strong magnetic fluctuations in multi-orbital systems. As I told you, these can create vertex divergences, negative eigenvalues, and they may trigger in multi-orbital systems phase separation instabilities, or in the parent channel, even as plus minus superconductivity. On the other hand, if we think of non-local correlations, we could think that the, the short range antiferromagnetic fluctuations, which we would have, for example, in the cluster DMFT calculation, again represent a strong antiferromagnetic fluctuation, which will create vertex divergences. And this in turn could bring about charge density wave instabilities or others. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk and I'm happy to uh, accept all your questions. Thanks again for the, for the attention.